Okay. So we are live. I just want to welcome Carrie Welch. Um, There you are. Okay. So, Carrie Welch, um, her presentation is Temporal Experience, Electric Brainwave States, and Get Your Structures of Consciousness. Uh, Carrie is a philosopher of time, mind, and physics, specializing in the science of temporal perception. She teaches at the California Institute of Physical Studies and the University of Phoenix School of Science. Thank you. I'd like to start with just a quick mindful moment. So if you will uh, just find a comfortable position and just getting in touch with your breath for a second. Just bring your attention to the inhale and exhale. And seeing if you can sense the subtle <coughs> rhythm of your heart within the rhythm of your breath. Either just beating in your chest or you can bring your hands to your wrist, or to your cardioid or under your chin. Just getting in touch with your pulse. The rhythm of your pulse feeling. How is it interacting? Just a couple more words here to fill in the gap. We can continue to do that as I'm speaking. And getting at the uh, interweaving of frequencies that I'll be talking about a little bit later. But I want to start with a story first um, about Hans Berger. Happened in 1893. He was, had started out his uh, education in mathematics, but was feeling disaffected with it, and so ended up enrolling in the military. And he was doing a cavalry exercise. His horse scooped and veered through the ground in the middle of the path of an onslaught of a Cavalry born cannon. Thought he was going to die, you know, near death experience. Kind of, not really near death experience, no major experience for him. But what happened 100 kilometers away, his sister had a profound experience of his imminent endangerment mm. and asked his fa her father, please send a telegram and make sure he's okay. Mm. And were able to stop the, the horse cart. And so Hans was fine. But he later received this telegram from his sister and said, how did you know? And so right about the same time that this accident happened, uh, the radio was coming into being. And so there was this idea that electrical waves could propagate information across empty space. Um, and so Hans became fascinated with the idea of how could brains communicate to one another using the electrical properties of our bodies across vast distances? And this became the driving force of inquiry over his life. Um, he comes from a kind of interesting background. His grandfather was a poet and professor of Oriental languages who spoke 30 languages. Uh, um, that was his maternal grandfather. And his father was a, a doctor at an asylum. And I imagine he had plenty of experience with uh, a wide range of experiences of consciousness as a result of that. Um, so he did become a psychiatrist himself, and he's the inventor of the EEG, the electroencephalogram, which is just electrodes from the skull to measure the subtle electric, electrical activity of the brain. Um, the path to that invention wasn't as easy as um, one would think because he was investigating these things and often uh, relegated as a as a crank. His initial experiments with electrical activity in the brain didn't really bear much fruit. So he was also looking at brain temperature and pulsations in the brain um, and a number of different things. Um, and 
it was 1924, so he was born in 37, so he was already well on in years by the time he managed to measure the first EEG measurement on it. Um, so in so in 1924, he was able to measure he, he by using vacuum tubes to amplify the electrical signal 100 times. Because the signals, the electricity that our brain produces is so subtle that the technology he was using was not sufficient to, to detect it, basically. Um, so he managed to, to piece together the right technology. But he continued to experiment it with, for five years, doing thousands of readings on people before he published about it. And he did this, did this very secretly wouldn't let anybody into his lab continually push people away because they were, uh, you know, they thought he was crazy, basically. Nobody wanted to take him seriously. He was continuing to lecture on telepathy. Um, and, and so it was, it was not an easy road for him to continue these experiments. Of course, once he got that first measurement, then he knew he was onto something. And the first distinction that he made in the measurements was between an alpha brainwave state and a beta brainwave state. Um, which is alpha and beta. So they're named in the order of their discovery rather than their frequency differentiation. So alpha and beta right here are the most obvious because they change when you close your eyes. You go from when your eyes are open, you're typically alert thinking beta, close your eyes, immediate downgrade to a lower frequency. Reflecting, doing inner reflection. Um, and so that was the first distinction that he made. Um, so he, continu he continued to do the research published in 1929. And I was curious, I, and I find it up here, you may be wondering why I'm talking about Hans Berger and the Durham BEG, and what does that have to do with cancer in Asia? Um, and the fascinating thing is the, the way that Gebser's structures of consciousness line up with the five EEG brainwave states um, that we differentiated mm -hmm. things into. Um, and particularly, what is the role of meditation in discerning what might be the EEG physiological correlate of the integral structure of consciousness? Um, and so I really wanted to look and see did Gebser know about the EEG when he was developing his structures of consciousness? Um, because he's, they're coming from very different methodologies, but coming arriving at similar results. So Gebser's coming from a cultural analysis, utilizing science also. So he did have lots of scientific developments included in his work, but I could not find one where he referenced the EEG. Though it is possible that it was in his field of um, people he was talking to, because as I've got highlighted right there, he was in Paris between 36 and 40 at the same time that EEG was finally becoming used in, in psychological practice in the US, the UK, and Paris. Um, and so backing up a little bit, uh, Berger did publish his work in 1929, but was disregarded until um, two British experimenters went to disprove his theory and corroborated it. And then people began to take him seriously. Um, and so that was in 1934. So this has you know, been a long, a long haul for him. And then it wasn't until 1937 that it really became spread and used in psychology. Um, he went, Gebsberg, Gerberger went to a conference in Paris in 1937 where he was an honored, distinguished speaker. And he, you know, accepted with tears in his eyes and said, in Germany, I'm not so popular. <laughs> um, because in that same year, basically, uh, the Nazis were rising to power. He was, it's, it's unclear what his relationship with the Nazis were, was, but he had to retire before he was necessarily ready. He did not continue his research. Um, and he hung himself about four years later. Um, there's speculation, there, there's evidence that he was invited to participate in the Gen Genetic Health Committee um, and that he accepted that, but whether he actually participated is unclear. Um, 
but he had dealt with depression all of his life and had a severe skin disease at the point when he hung himself, which I think he thought the skin, the skin disease was fatal. Um, but people said, had he survived the war, he would have won a Nobel Prize for his work. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And so, so there's this overlap in Paris when the EEG is becoming used. Um, Gebser's also in Paris at that time and then escapes to Switzerland as the Nazis are rising um, and is working with you. So that's another research alley I'd like to travel down um, to see, you know, is you working with EEG? Is he aware of it? Is he using it? He's writing it in the after good times. That's another place Gebser could have. Um, encountered the, this particular breakdown. Um, and so let's just walk through the EEG brainwave states really quick. And I think you'll, you'll see fairly quickly how the, the correspondence, at least those of you who are familiar with the actual structures of consciousness. Um, so the delta brainwave state, state is what we experience during deep sleep. It's the longest, slowest brainwave state. It's this rhythm. One, two, four, Beats per second. So in between those two, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's deep sleep. It's also the predominant brainwave state in base. Um, so we start out in this long, slow frequency and gradually layer in shorter, faster frequencies. Uh, so theta, the next brainwave state, uh, is measured during hypnagogic states of consciousness. When you're falling asleep, when whole characters are popping into your head, and there might be auditory hallucinations, you think you hear some, somebody call your name. Um, it's a theta, it's a sleep transition. It's also ch early childhood, ages two to six, are in a predominantly theta brainwave state. It's kind of a dreamlike state. It makes imaginary friends make a lot more sense. It makes past life memories make a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. If you just remember that this is where children are living, they're not up here where we typically think of consciousness as existing there in a very different um, time space, which we'll get into when we layer Gebster's uh, structures onto these states. Um, so the theta brainwave frequency is also the shamanic drumbeat. Four to seven hertz, four to seven beats per minute, beats per, yeah, per second. Um, and so that, that shamanic drumbeat is driving the active imagination when somebody is traveling and getting a healing during their shamanic healing. It's utilizing that hypnagogic brainwave state to access a deeper layer where that, you know, where nourishment can be received from that timeless the timeless void, and I'm getting into the temporality of it already, but we'll get there. Um, and then from theta, then there's alpha, which is just the resting. Closed eyes, not thinking about anything specific. That's your alpha resting brainwave state. Kids arrive there between ages five and eight. Um, and then comes in the beta, 12 to 25 hertz or beats per second. Uh, kids hit that between eight and 12. And as you can see, much faster. Then uh, the fifth brainwave state is gamma, which is typically 25 to 100 hertz. So it's a much wider range and it's a much faster frequency. Um, 40 hertz is the typical signature frequency. Um, and it's related to unifying consciousness, to putting things together in the brain, to linking different parts of the brain. Um, but it's also one that has been only researched more recently, so we don't know as much of that. It's not as obvious what it is. What it relates to. Um, and it's also worth noting that if you take the midpoint of each of these uh, frequency st states, they're in harmonic relationship to each other. They're basically a doubling of the one before it. And so if you take the middle there as two, or if you start at one, 2.5, so that you say 2.5 is the middle of delta, 5 is the middle of theta, 10 is the middle of alpha, 20 is the middle of beta, 40 is the middle of gamma. And so there's this harmonic relationship between the frequencies. Um, and that's what I'm going to argue is more important to the integral structure of consciousness than specifically looking at just the gamma. But it's the, um, the way the frequencies fit together that allow them to communicate with each other, that allow us to transition between them. Okay. 
right, so let's layer in the answer structures of consciousness and the insights that, of temporality that comes with that. Um, so Gebser refers to the archaic as a deep sleep. So it matches just beautifully onto that delta um, prior to conscious experience of any sort of time, any sort of um, anything we can articulate other than just talk around. Um, temporality in the archaic is non-differentiated or zero-dimensional. Moving into the magical, we're moving into this um, one-dimensional temporality where the only thing that is happening is the present moment, and it's a synchronistic form of meaning-making so that when things are happening at the same time, that links them in meaning. Um, then moving into the mythic, we're moving into that cyclic, a two-dimensional temporal structure where there's not only the concrete present moment, but now we have a once upon a time, a, uh, a mythic realm of gods and goddesses in those stories and how they map onto our concrete realm. So it's this division between the imminent and the transcendent, these stories that we tell and how they layer into our daily lives in this cyclical manner coming back again and again. Um, similarly, uh, I forgot to link it up here. So alpha being this meaning-making um, space where you're internally focused, you're separating yourself from the external world. Um, so there's this division that happens. There's, this, there's, a, there's an internal meaning-making story fabrication that happens to hold the world together. Um, in the theta brainwave state, if you kind of think of that as that hypnagogic dreamlike state, um, temporality isn't linear causal. Like if you think about a dream, you know, you can, the dream can play out one way and you're like, oh, I actually don't want it to go that way. Go back and redo it. Um, and so the temporality of dreams and the magical structure of consciousness is much more fluid. Um, and we typically think that the linear causal clock time is the definition of temporality. Um, but these are all equally valid experiences of time. Um, and in other work, I argue that this is, this is a deepening into time, that the archaic is the timelessness, and then that layering in of, of faster and faster frequencies is creating more and more division, which is creating a sense of longer and longer time um, and giving it a sense of extension. So then the mental structure of consciousness maps beautifully onto the active thinking data brainwave state um, and introduces the linear causal temporality, the division of three-dimensional time, which I think of as past, present, and future. Um, and then in the, in the integral, it says we move into a four-dimensional time. And, and I take that fourth point. He talks about the fourth dimension as the subjective dimension of time. And so we have the clock time, past, present, and future, but we also have its interaction with our subjective experience of time, which is always very different than what the clock tells us. It's always going slower or faster, often because we're navigating between these other states. We're not existing here solely. Um, so then the question becomes, it's like, okay, all these match up really nicely, uh, brainwave states and structures of consciousness, but the integral, you know, is that just gamma? I'm not completely satisfied with that. Gamma does a, shows up in a lot of interesting places in meditation studies in particular for, for raising the baseline of, of gamma, and I'll show some images to make that idea make sense. Um, but I think, and it, because there's a lot of jumps going on here, right? So the first jump is meditation is the integral structure of consciousness, and, and that's a jump. I think, and, I've, and we've heard this a few times articulated in different talks, is that um, Gibson, it wasn't the, the mystical experience isn't the integral structure of consciousness. It's an experience of participation and an experience of the transparency of all of the structures. You're not removing yourself from daily life, but you're participating. Um, and, and, so, and so the idea I've been working with is that it's more of an ease of moving between these and, you know, with the hope of being able to hold them simultaneously. Um, and so while gamma might be, while well, meditation, so meditation I consider a tool for being able to do that, to navigate between these different modes of consciousness, 
um, but is not the end all be all. It is not the integral. It's not where we're trying to go. Um, it's a process to get us there. Um, so the same idea with gamma. So gamma and, and meditation studies are complex also. It's not just that they um, increase gamma. Uh, so, so in order to kind of discuss what those things do, let's, let's do some simple before we go there. So I want to argue also that merging or bringing Gebser into dialogue with EEG brainwave states really reinforces the notion of a fractal structure of both the brainwave states and of Gebser's um, structures. And so we could, so a fractal is just something where the pattern repeats across scale. So you have a big pattern, and then nested within it, you have a smaller iteration of that pattern. And that may go down infinitely, or it may stop at a certain point in scale. Um, that's actually not the full definition of a fractal. The, the true definition of a fractal is that it is non-differentiable, which means you cannot predict um, where it's going to go next. The more you zoom in on the line, the more squiggly it gets. It's not a straight line. I, I know if I'm here and I know what direction the line's going, I can predict where it's going to be then. Uh, so this is differentiable. But if it's a squiggly line and it's squiggly on all scales, I can never predict where it's going to go next. And so it brings in this notion of eruption, of not knowing when a mutation is going to happen. Um, and, and it comes in beautifully in, so these are all spatial fractals that we're looking at, but we're looking at this to get an idea of what a fractal is so that then we can talk about control fractals, which are about how patterns in time then show up on long scales of time and then shorter scales of time and shorter scales of time. So any harmony that you feel with your ear is a fractal structure. That harmonic structure is a, you know, a doubling down of the frequencies. Um, and so just to get the visual, this is the, the building of Coke curve here, which you can see just the infinite zooming in on and that little gif right there. But if you just start with the basic structure of the Coke curve, just a straight line, you bump out the little third into a triangle, and then you take each of those straight lines and bump out the little third into a triangle. And so you've made a smaller iteration of that same larger pattern and you do it for each of the straight lines in that pattern. And then you take this little straight line and you go out the middle and put a little triangle there. And so what you end up with something is with an infinite surface area or perimeter within a finite space, which is a beautiful metaphor for time because of the paradox of the moment, which is simultaneously passing and the only thing but eternal. Um, and so it's both finite and infinitely deep. And so when I talk about deepening time, deepening into the timelessness of the present moment, that's infinite fractal depths. It's, it's a dimension of scale that is um, unfolding. And so if we want to, these, these can be referred to as levels of description. That's Susan Global's word. She has a, a model for subjective, a, a fractal model of subjective time. And so Gebser's structures of consciousness because they're operating on a you know, millennia time scale would be our largest structure of consciousness. If you wanted to extend back to the evolution of the cosmos, you know, you have our scale larger than that. Um, and then when we look at EEG, we have the, the individual lifetime developmental, going from the baby in delta wave to a child in beta brainwave state to a younger, to a slightly older child and alpha that gradually layering in. So over the period of a lifetime. So this is over a millennia, this is over a lifetime. Or maybe this might be the lifetime that makes up millennia. So the scale is off here, but the idea is going to get across is that it's a small part of the same pattern the whole. Um, EEG also shows up in our sleeping and waking cycles, right? We go to Delta every single night. We experience beta every day. We experience alpha every day. We experience theta every day. Um, but not in the same, uh, you know, and, it, and it's never, the developmental trajectory is never clear, which Gebser really points to. He's like, it's not like you go somewhere and you never go back to the other structures. 
you know, it, it erupts once and it might stay there for a little bit and you might go back to the other one. And there's this non-differentiable bouncing between the structures, which has a general impetus in the direction of the integral. Um, and I think it's the same thing over the course of a lifetime and the same thing over the course of a day, but it becomes even less directional over the course of the day, except for the fact that we always come from and return to that delta archaic piece. Um, and then when you start thinking about that, there's the, in, in any moment of the day, there would be that next level of scale down the now, you know, which structure of conscious are you in now, which brain you state are you in now, um, is even less predictable. And so there's a sense of, unpredictability in actually increasing with finer and finer scales. Um, it goes right along with the motion. And so this image up here is just to get you thinking about this in terms of waves, right? So if you think about that top arc and coming down here as the you know larger wave and then underneath the harmonic cutting in half and then cutting that one in. Well, it doesn't quite go in half. I think the next one will. The idea that there's a beauty when waves fit together in a harmonic proportion, and that it's a fractal repetition of scale, repetition of pattern across scale. Um, so to get into, to show how these different uh, brainwave states interact, um, we're just a little, little basic wave mechanics. So if you've got one wave and another wave and they're in phase, so their troughs are in the same place and their crests are in the same place, they will constructively interfere and the wave will amplify. So the trough deepens, the crest gets higher. If you have the trough in the same place as the crest and vice versa, destructive interference, they'll cancel out. And so um, this is just a, get your brain in the mindset and when you put two waves together, they don't always act, you know, it's hard to predict how they're going to act, right? Um, and that's basically what's happening when we're looking at uh, brainwave states. So here it's divided into those different brainwave states, the signature waves for each of the brainwave states. Down here, we've taken it from the time domain, where this is the axis of time, Maybe this was a recording for, you know, just a couple seconds right here. Um, and into the domain of frequencies. So now frequency is along the bottom. So you can see one to four hertz corresponds to delta right there. And so that's where delta shows up. Four to eight hertz is where theta shows up. Eight to 12, alpha, and then that whole thing is gamma. Oh, no, sorry, theta and gamma. Um, and so what's happening over here, if you think about, this is the raw EEG signal at the top, and then it can be divided into these separate bands. And so it's like playing a chord on a guitar. You hear one sound, but if you can divide it into what each of those, the notes that each of those strings are playing, right? So if you think of these as your strings of your guitar, and that's the chord, then this is a way you can analyze it and say, okay, which of those strings is giving you the, the biggest part of the sound, which is it has the most power. Um, and that's what, when we talk about uh, a particular bandwidth dominating the EEG, so in this one right here, this is an alpha dominated EEG signal. Um, so you can kind of see the difference in this other slide. That's also alpha dominated. So this is an EEG signature see with their eyes closed. Close your eyes, bam, all the shoots up. You can see the difference right here. This is eyes open, the one in the foreground, and then the gray is the, with eyes closed, out the shoots up. Um, and so just to give you another visual of what that looks like, these again are the different strings of the guitar or the brainwave states that the eventual, or the total wave, the core, can be divided into via fast forwarding transform. Um, and I've gone for 30 minutes, <laughs> so I'm going to show you um, 
So this is one example of a study where they did three different ty types of meditation, and they showed that in long-term meditators, their gamma waves, these are all those different forms of meditation of the Himalayan yoga, Isha Shuri yoga and Vipassana. And so long-term meditators, both their baseline and their um, experience during meditation, their gamma waves, so this, you know, those, all these fast frequencies on the end were elevated from the control group, where gamma was a little bit lower. Um, is, is this during meditation or just? Um, I think this particular graph is from during the meditation, but they also found that not during meditation, their gamma was also elevated. Um, and so that's one reason that uh, gamma is associated. If, if we look at, the, at meditation as a tool that we use to get at the integral, and we want to know what's going on during the brain during meditation. It's all, it also shows that theta and alpha, so this is alpha bandwidth right there, is also bumped up in meditators. And that's mostly what people had looked at before was the alpha and theta increases during meditation. But more recently, they've been looking at the beta also. Um, and so, which piece is it? It's hard to say. Um, Kind of talk about that already, and I will um, save you from the long slide. Mm -hmm. um, that's the end goal is yes, thank you for that. Is ever receiving, it's an infinite game, as I think that's Caroline Casey's you know, taking it from somebody else. I don't know, um, but there's finite and infinite games, and so it's not like the, the integral is ever somewhere we're going to get, but it's something that we continue to, to work towards and get. Um, and, then, and then there's also the notion of, uh, and I'm over time, so I'll just stop. There's, I can, I can, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I don't know if we have time for questions since we're already late. At the end of the morning. Okay. So I'll stop there. If you want more.